for coming. Um, well, as you said, my name is Ethan Wong. I'm Spencer Adi. And we've both have been uh, collecting and wearing vintage for about four years now. Yeah. Uh, we wear it on like a semi-regular basis. And Disneyland, we always take the opportunity to come in full vintage. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I've gone to the, the since like one of the first Apparies like in 2012. Yeah, I think you know, we both started going around the same time before we actually knew each other. So. Yeah, and it actually got us into vintage menswear mm -hmm. in the first place. And so, you know, a lot of people come and ask us, you know, where do we get it? You know, how do we make it work without looking too costumey? And so, uh, Justin asked us to talk about it today and share it with you guys. So, uh, you might be thinking, okay, why vintage? What makes it, you know, special <clears throat> and something you can wear, uh, you know, from like Macy's, Banana Republic, something you can find at the mall? Well, Spencer would like to say that the, uh, the devil is in the details. details. Uh, so the, the, the first thing, you're going to see a lot of patterns and fabrics that you're not going to see for the most part with modern suits. Uh, that is mostly because, you know, back then guys tended to wear suits just about every day. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things like, once again, patterns and fabrics. And then later we have details like belt backs, patch pockets, stuff like that. That kind of you know allowed guys to have their own unique look, right? You while know, still would, dressing up, it would kind of be like you know you have a, a formal suit and mm -hmm. you have a kind of a casual suit with all the bells and whistles that you can stand out in. Exactly. Then we have uh, the the manufacturing tended to be a little bit more high quality. Uh, guys could not afford to buy you know suits every year, so they had to be made to last. Mm -hmm. So an off the rack suit from the 1930s and 40s, that's usually going to have the same kind of you know quality that like a bespoke suit would have today. Yeah, fully custom, you know. Super 120s, Super 150s, well, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and so getting into that right now, the prices, again, if you wanted to get a suit that was the same level of quality as a you know 30s or 40s suit, you would have to pay thousands of dollars to get it bespoke, but we pay maybe 250 300 on average, maybe like at most. And then you add like a little bit for you know extra tailoring to kind of make it fit right, mm -hmm. but you still get a high quality garment at exactly. a much, much more affordable price. Okay, so... Next, uh, we have uh, where to find it. Now, that's something that I kind of went through when I first came to Dapper Day. I came in in like an H&M suit, and there's nothing wrong with H&M. You know, it's a nice place to get kind of a cool suit. But I noticed that these guys were wearing something similar to what we're wearing today, you know, a double-breasted suit, you know, cool suits with like a, you know, an odd vest. And I said, you know, where did you guys get that stuff? Like, is it, is it custom? Did you guys have to spend thousands of dollars? And they said, no, we, you know, we know where to find it. We buy it on eBay. Uh, you know, we, there's a whole bunch of vintage sales. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he invited me and I kind of got into this whole world of collecting vintage. And so here are some of the places that we uh, get our pieces from. So there are kind of like, uh, what we, like, you know, vintage stores. That's where it's kind of more curated. That's where you're going to find the best stuff. Mm -hmm. And so a couple different places. There's Joyride Vintage. That's in the orange circle, like 10, 15 minutes away. I go there like every weekend. Yeah, we're there pretty much all the time. Uh, there's Reese's Vintage Pieces. He is actually here at the expo. Go check him out. Uh, and he, he's, he's got one of the largest collections of uh, vintage suits, dress shirts, and ties mm -hmm. outside of like a costuming warehouse. It's literally like his whole garage is filled with vintage. Yep. Uh, there's so a couple cool. in LA. There's Paper Moon Vintage. Uh, that's actually the first uh, place I went to back in like 2013. Mm -hmm. First vintage store I ever went to. Super cool. And Super then great. there's, uh, this is a new one. It's uh, Monsivis & Co. Uh, and in addition to vintage menswear, they also, he also sells uh, reproduction caps and ties. Yeah, with like super high quality. Yeah. You know, straight out of the I have a, I have a couple of both his caps and ties and they're great. Yeah. Not a sponsored yeah. post. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so next, uh, once you learn the details of how to source vintage, how to find the real cool vintage play, uh, pieces, you can go to like flea markets, uh, thrift stores, and even buy them on eBay. And again, you know, we want to make sure that you buy the right vintage. You know, that you're not getting something from like the 80s or 90s. Um, but it definitely helps if you want to get something a lot cheaper. Because we consider going to a vintage store to be paying retail. Again, like you know, 200, 300 dollars. Uh, but on eBay, you know, if someone mislabels a suit or you know, they have an auction up, you can get it for, you know, $100. And I, mm -hmm. I usually get my suits, you know, 100 or less, stuff like that. Um, again, thrifting, you know, that's way cheaper. You know, Goodwill has prices for suits like 10 to 20 bucks. But again, it takes a very keen eye to find it. Uh, but you can always try it on, which is a big plus. Um, and then uh, flea markets is something that I started going to. Uh, it's cool to find more accessories, you know, maybe like a tie or some sort of like, you know, jewelry or something. It's kind of hard to find clothes. But again, it's a cool place to kind of check out. And it's still a lot of fun to mm -hmm. do. And so, uh, back when I said about the 80s and 90s, we <coughs> use a term called true vintage um, to kind of differentiate against like the 80s and 90s because today people kind of call that still vintage. Uh, well, you call true vintage anything made from the 1960s and earlier. That's when you get the high quality manufacturing, a lot of uh, handiwork still made by hand. Um, 
And so here are some of the, uh, the cool qualities for that. So the easiest way to determine how old a garment is, uh, is through the tags. There's the union tags that refers to the labor union that manufactured them. And then there are just the uh, kind of the brand tags, the designer label tags. Uh, and that is the brand or store that sold them. Uh, you're going to find them in mostly uh, natural fibers. You're not going to find any synthetics unless you know start going in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, there's going to be a lot of details that kind of set them apart from modern suits. Uh, this varies by decade, but usually they have a little bit of shoulder padding, uh, slightly wider lapels, and a higher rise. That kind of, in our opinion, looks a little bit more flattering and once again just sets it apart from modern suits. And so next here we have some examples of union tags. Now again, like Spencer says, these were the manufacturing labor unions that would sew these kind of into the uh, interior of the men's breast pocket. Um, you know, they kind of look very, you know, similar, but if you look, you know, very closely, there's some small details that set them apart. Like a 1939 label might be different from a 1940s label. Uh, a 1949 label, which actually went into service in the 1950s and 60s, uh, is a little bit different from the older ones. Uh, basic rule of thumb is that if it's a lot more cluttered and a lot more blocky, it's it's earlier, while uh, later ones will be a lot more minimalistic. And I, and I think we have a link to this image yeah. somewhere in your blog, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All, all the stuff can be found on the blog in a lot mm -hmm. more detail. Um, but again, looking for this stuff in American-made clothing, it doesn't really apply to European stuff, uh, but it basically tells you, uh, gives you a good idea of how old the garment is and when it was manufactured. Uh, then we have the designer labels. Now this isn't, they usually don't have like any specific dates on them, but if you have kind of a passing knowledge of graphic design history or typographic history, it can give you an idea of when it's made. Uh, generally stuff like this is going to, you're just going to know it's going to be like pre-60s, 70s. Right, yeah. Just because it has, you know, it's a little bit more fun. They kind of have it's like, like an artistic quality yeah, art, to them. They're yeah. artsy. And then as we get into the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you tend to get the very kind of minimalistic, just like, you know, it's kind of corporate. corporate. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so lining is another good indication of not only just vintage, but a good quality made garment. Um, most suits today and probably like 80s and 90s will have full lining. This refers to kind of the, uh, the shiny fabric found on the inside of the jacket. And a lot of vintage ones, especially pre-1960, will be half lined or have no lining at all. <coughs> and the reason that we say it's more it's a quality made garment is because you can't hide any imperfections, any mistakes in the, in the, in the seams and the creation of the garment. Um, and also, it's technically an extra layer. So again, if you're wearing like a, a warmer suit, um, it'll have full lining. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you have a summer suit, you want something with that's half lined or no lining just so the garment will breathe better and get a little bit more airflow. Oh. And so like we said, uh, if, when, you're, when you're getting something, if it's made after the 60s and 70s, generally it's going to have a tag that says exactly you know, what uh, fabric percentage it's made of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we recommend you try to stick to the natural fibers. Uh, stuff like cottons, linen, silk, wools, of course. Um, and, but, and then, again, in the 60s and 70s, you're going to find a lot of polyester. We recommend you just avoid that because it does not breathe well, it just looks cheap, it feels fake, and it's just kind of uncomfortable. Right, yeah, exactly. Um, one good indication of vintage, uh, <coughs> again, quality garments in general, are classic patterns. Uh, again, these kind of set your garment apart from something that you normally see. Because you, know, you walk into the mall, you mainly have the more corporate suits, navy blue, black, charcoal. And like Spencer says, back in the day when you wore a suit every day, you wanted something a little bit more special, something to stand out. So in the front, uh, on top here, you've got kind of a plaid. Uh, this particular plaid is called Prince of Wales check. You've got uh, herringbone, which is kind of a repeated chevron pattern. Houndstooth over there in the corner. Uh, window pane, which is a kind of a more minimalistic version of plaid. A fleck, which is kind of cool because from far away, it looks solid. When you get, uh, when you get closer, you can see that there's got you know, a little bit of uh, yellow threads, red, uh, reds, different color blues kind of sewn in there. And then you've got the classic uh, pinstripe and chalk stripe. Very businessy. Yeah, very conservative. Yeah. Okay, so here's something that I haven't found a lot in in a lot of other vintage menswear blogs and just menswear in general, but it's about the buttoning stance. Now, the buttoning stance refers to the place uh, where you fasten your jacket. On a three-button jacket, you guys should know it's the, in the, it's the middle button, the second button, or if it's the uh, two-button suit, it's the top button. Now, throughout the eras, um, the place of the buttoning would change. But you can see at here in the 1940s, these, uh, I think they're Yale College students. The button extends is kind of right in the middle of the jacket. It provides a very flattering figure, kind of like got that hourglass shape. 
Um, and then you compare that to Leonardo DiCaprio. Who looks like Frankenstein's monster. Yeah, yeah he does. I mean, he's got like heavy shoulder pads and kind of like a, his button stance is very, very low. Um, you'll see this a lot in like the late 50s, but especially in late 70s to the early 90s kind of garments. And it's just, we don't think it's really that flattering. Because, uh, you know, again, you want to be kind of a bit more proportional. And, uh, you know, if, if his jacket just kind of buttoned like right there, it would have been a lot better. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you compare the two, I think that the, the 1940s Yale students look a lot more classic. And, they, you know, if you just, you know, made a little bit more adjustments, it's not that different of someone that's well-dressed today. Okay. And uh, lastly, we have large uh, or wider lapels. Again, this kind of varied from era to era. Uh, but mostly what you see uh, in uh, most stores today, they're kind of a slim lapel, maybe about like two to two, two, and, uh, two, and, two and a half uh, inch lapels. And this one is a 1940s jacket. It's like approaching almost five, mm -hmm. five inches. But we think it, you know, it, not only does it look a little bit different than what you normally see, but it kind of provides a more, that kind of got that V shape, and with a natural buttoning sex right in the middle, it doesn't look out of proportion. And it's kind of got that classic look. All right. So now we're gonna talk about fit, because it does not matter. We're gonna talk about this a lot. It does not matter how cool your suit looks. If it doesn't fit right, it's not gonna look good. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so here are the basics to fit. I, I spent like the first like <laughs> two years of being into vintage just buying stuff regardless of whether or not it fit, and I ended up wasting a lot of money for suits that I do not wear anymore. Uh, the most important thing is you need to make sure the shoulders fit right. If the shoulders don't fit right, it's there's nothing that can be done about it, yep. and it's just not gonna look good. Yeah. Uh, the jacket, you don't want it to be too long or too short. The, the general rule of thumb is uh, just have it cover your seat. Uh, the jacket sleeves should not go further than your wrist. Uh, then we have, so the jacket should be, should not be tight, but we don't want it to be loose. So just so it gives you kind of a more subtle hourglass, the button shouldn't look like it's about to pop off, stuff like that. Uh, same thing, thing, same thing for the tran or for the trousers. Trow. The trance. The trance, the trousers. Uh, we don't want them to be really skinny, like, you know, skinny fit, but they also should okay, be. Okay, it's also up to personal preference, yeah. you know, the 60s were a lot slimmer than earlier, um, but, you know, again, they should, they should fit right and be comfortable. Mm-hmm. And then this is this last one is really up to personal preference, but but we're pretty we're much sticklers. sticklers on this. Yeah, so we believe that the best length of pant is a slight break or a no break, uh, and that is where the uh, pant is just kind of hitting the top of your shoe. Uh, it's not like you know the fabric's not kind of like pulling at all. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so here's some examples of illustrations, nineteen thirties and forties. Um, you can see that the shoulders fit spot on. There's no rumbling. It's not you know too tight farther in or extended. Um, there's got that hourglass figure across you know all, all all three of these guys. And the pants, like we said, you know they, they rest just gently on the top of the shoe. Maybe a slight crease there for like a very very slight break, but you can see that it's it's very it's a very clean look. And you know a lot of people think that vintage is baggy. Mm -hmm. You got zoot suits, and while that is definitely a look from the era, you know most of the time guys look like this. And if you don't believe us. Here are real guys wearing it back in the 1930s uh, and 40s. You've got Jimmy Stewart here with a, you know, pretty much a perfectly cut suit. You've got guys in the 30s wearing you know, fitted jackets. There's no pulling at the buttons here. Uh, pants, you know, they, they break very gently, uh, but not too much. And you've got a uh, picture of guys in the mid-20s from Australia, again, wearing some just perfect pants. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would marry these pants. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, basically, that's kind of the rule of thumb there. Okay, so you should know what you can and can't fix with, uh, with a suit. If you get something and it doesn't fit perfectly at first, that's okay. Yeah, We have to get almost everything tailored. I, I'm at the tailor like twice a week. Mm -hmm. And I can't afford to do that. So, no. <laughs> um, so the first thing, you like of course, you can uh, if the pants are a little bit tight or a little bit big, that can be pretty easily fixed. Yep. Uh, same thing for the coat sleeves and the pants. Uh, you can let you can like shorten them as much as you need. Let them out usually inch or two, yeah, inch two, two inches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you can take in a jacket and you can let it out. Usually there's about an inch allowance for that. We don't recommend doing this a lot <laughs> um, oh. unless you really really trust your tailor. Uh, you can shorten a jacket by about an inch. Yeah, because again, you know, lots of vintage garments are a lot longer than what you'd expect. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a, kind of a shorter guy, I've kind of run into this problem. I don't have that problem. No, he doesn't. <laughs> He's like six feet tall. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I do get my stuff shortened. Again, just an inch or less. Otherwise, it just kind of yeah, it kind of throws it off. You know, it kind of gets too close to the buttoning stance. And again, that's 
button extension is also is very important because you know it shows the balance of the jacket. And then of course you can also taper the leg. So yep. you know if you don't want them super wide, you can take them in mm -hmm. a little bit. Exactly. Uh, again, you can't fix shoulders. Nothing that can be done about that. It's nope. impossible. Uh, you can't lengthen the jacket even after you shorten yeah, it. Yeah, there's no, they don't really leave anything extra in there. So if you shorten it, that's you know, you're playing it close to the chest there if you really want to do it. And then you can't alter the rise of the pants. Yeah. Uh, so if they're if they have a low waist, there's not much that can yeah, be we, done there. Yeah, we wear high rise trousers all the mm -hmm. time. Um, and so some guys ask us, oh, where can we get it? Can we tailor our pants to do that? And you really, you, it's something you just have to buy and, yeah. you know, get later. So. And so here you can see, this is how you're going to be able to tell how much you can let out a garment. The coat, which is quarter lined right there. Uh, so that way you can immediately see how much there is. There is a seam in the center, and then there are also the seams on the sides. Generally, you're going to be you're going to have an inch, two inches at most. Yeah, if you're lucky. If you're lucky, but generally it's just going to be an inch. And then we have the pants, so this is a lot easier to see. Uh, it's just on the center seam in the back, and that's usually two in, two inches, maybe. Right. Two yeah. And a half. So yeah, usually the rule of thumb, one or two inches when you're buying a jacket. Even applies to off the rack clothing at yeah. a modern store. You know, if something doesn't fit quite right, you can get it tailored. If it's anything more than that, you might have to try a different size. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, we're sticklers on pant length, um, and here's kind of an extreme case. Uh, this is a 1970s suit that I got, um, and you can see, you know, it fits well through the thigh. You know, it's not too crazy, but right here is where the big problem is. I know most people don't have them that long, but you can see the importance of tailing right there. They end just above the shoe. Uh, I added a cuff that adds kind of a bit more drape, so they hang and have that, that nice line through the center of the leg. I got them tapered just a little bit, but they're not uh, too skinny. And uh, here's a good case study, doing everything we just said into practice. This is a 1960s Brooks Brothers suit that I got on eBay for 100 bucks. Um, and see, the jacket isn't too bad, uh, the pants not too bad, but when you, when you go to the tailor, you can just you know, make it look perfect. Uh, you know, there's a little bit more waist suppression in the jacket there. It's shortened just a little bit. Um, again, nothing more than an inch, it still looks proportional. There's no pulling at the button here. And the pants, again, are uh, hemmed perfectly with a cuff. So this, in our opinion, is kind of the perfect fit for a suit. This is, this is what you can aspire to. <laughs> um, so you can see that the coat has just a little bit of the waist suppression. Uh, but the button's not pulling, doesn't look too tight. And then we can see the pants. Look how clean those are. Look at uh, straight line. Yeah, straight line, no break. They have the cuff. And fun fact. I own a suit almost identical to that, so. Well, we didn't wear it today because we thought that'd be kind of weird. Yep. <laughs> right, so yeah, basically that's, and this is a, like a 1960s Brooks Brothers mm -hmm. sack suit. Again, Brooks Brothers is actually here today as well. They make you know, some really great stuff. Yeah, uh, just a really quick side note. Uh, if, you're, if you're going for vintage, if you can find a Brooks Brothers number one sack suit which is made before, vintage. yeah, that one right there, made before the 1970s, the design did not change from the 1910s up until the 70s, and so yeah, you can... They're, they're pretty classic. Yeah, yeah, three buttons, again, just the wide lapels. They, you can wear this anywhere. You can wear it mm -hmm. dapper, you can wear it to work. You know? And it's not just brown, they had them in a variety of different colors. Yep. Okay, so again, we wear vintage on a, on a pretty much a regular basis, and so we get a question like, again, how do you wear it without looking like a costume? And so here are some uh, good tips, because again, the details matter. Yep. So once again, if it doesn't fit right, it's just not going to look good. So make sure that it fits right. Uh, second thing, uh, make sure you wear something that's appropriate to the weather. I really like tweed suits, but I, I put them away during the like nine months of the year. Uh, just because, you know, if you're, wearing, if you're wearing a heavy tweed suit or a flannel suit when it's 105 degrees out, the suit might look good, but you're just going to look kind of silly. Right. Uh, so I, you know, invest in a lot of like cotton suits, linen suits, stuff like that, mm -hmm. uh, that look great when it's hotter outside. Uh, we're going to get into this in a second, but when you're mixing patterns, uh, the secret of that is just avoid similar scales. Mixing patterns is a really, really great way to kind of just do an easy vintage look. Mm -hmm. uh, color combinations, make sure they don't clash with each other. They should complement everything nicely. And then when it comes to accessorizing, this is just us personally. Uh, we like to kind of keep it subtle. Yeah, you know, maybe get a watch. You know, mm -hmm. a collar bar is a great way to be vintage. It's very easy. Just add yeah. it on. Tie bar, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you don't. Uh, we've seen like modern guys kind of wear a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, just kind of go easy on it. But if, if that's your thing to go bold, then go yeah. like, by all means, go ahead. Okay. So like Spencer said, Mixing patterns is really the key to vintage style. A lot of people think because things are black and white, things are very boring, when in reality, guys mix patterns all the time because they wore suits, they wanted to stand out. So here, 
This guy is wearing a striped shirt with a striped uh, suit and a dot tie. This guy is wearing a herringbone, <coughs> again, that kind of a multi-chevron uh, pattern, um, and a striped tie. And I think you can see he's even wearing like a varsity vest yeah. going on there. It's really cool. Um, and you can see it you know, in action, my simple shirt ads. I mean, they wore different colors together. You know, got, you got blue stripes with kind of a repeated white tie there. You got orange with white. Basically, you know, striped shirts. Again, we're gonna say this in a second, but yeah, we we love wearing blue striped shirts. We, I we both have like everything. thirty of them. You Get some blue striped like, shirts. Yeah, they, it really doesn't matter what tie you pick because you know, depending on the pattern and the scale, it'll it'll all work together. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that you know, here you've got kind of a bold stripe, and you've got a very minimally uh, printed tie. Uh, you've got really thin stripes here, and you've got kind of a a, a bigger uh, kind of scale pattern there. Um, again, you want to complement and not contra uh, clash, yep. basically. Yeah. So here are a couple examples of uh, Ethan doing this. Like we said, blue striped shirts. He's wearing all three of the photos. <laughs> Get some blue striped shirts. The first one, he's wearing a dark brown multi-stripe shirt or suit, and uh, he's kind of he's got a very like subtly striped shirt, like kind of just a the stripes are very close together. Yeah, like a micro shirt. Micro with shirt. kind of a, uh, a a wider like you know spaced uh, pattern on his tie. Yeah. Uh, the next one, he's got a a little bit of a bolder shirt and tie combo, and so he grounds that with a solid mm -hmm. coat. Uh, and then we can see the last one. It's a very bold tie, so he wears a very subtly striped shirt. And once again, the solid coat. Right. And so you can see, again, in countless examples, you know, you look at pictures of guys in the 1930s, not just movie stars, but regular guys. They mix patterns all the time. Like this guy, he's wearing a, uh, a window pane double resin suit with a striped shirt and a dot tie. And I think uh, he's wearing a plain suit here with a striped shirt and, again, another kind of a, a micro floral geometric print tie. Okay, and so this is something that I like to do because it's very kind of IV. Again, it still was done in the 30s, um, but it's stripes on stripes. And, like, you know, it's a lot more different than wearing a striped shirt with, like, a printed tie. But it, I still think it looks good, especially when you pay attention to the scaling. Uh, I'm wearing different types of striped shirts throughout all this. There's the blue sh uh, striped shirt again. Um, but you can notice that the ties are a lot bolder. They're a lot more block striped compared to the, uh, compared to the shirt. And so it, it complements and it's, you know, it, it adds a good accent to the, to the entire outfit. And I think also I'm wearing a lot of plain uh, color of the jackets here and you know, let, let the tie and the shirt be the kind of the star of the outfit. And you can see here, uh, Jimmy Stewart going with a triple threat. He's wearing a striped uh, suit with a striped shirt, striped tie. And uh, Fred Astaire wearing a striped shirt with a striped tie and then contrasting that with a kind of a closely uh, patterned herringbone. I'm sorry, hounds too. But basically, you know, you can get there. Stripes on stripes is a very vintage kind of thing. And a lot of guys don't do that because uh, they're kind of afraid of missing yeah. patterns. And um, most guys just wear kind of a plain shirt, plain tie, which is mm -hmm. fine too. But, uh, you know, if you want to add that extra vintage detail, you can definitely mix patterns. This next one is my favorite thing in the world. Uh, so as Ethan can attest, and if you guys have seen his blog, you can also probably know, you also know this. During the summer, I wear I have a pair of like linen cream pants that I wear like every other day because it goes with everything. It looks really great with grays, it looks good with blues, and it looks good with earth tones, brown, stuff like that. Uh, and you'll see in the middle, these guys are wearing striped uh, cream pants. So if you're going for a 20s summer look, that's a really easy way to do that. And so, and so here you have it in action here. There's Spencer's favorite pair of pants. Those, yep. those linen ones right there. You can see it works really well with a gray jacket. Uh, this is probably the simplest one. You wear kind of a cream, maybe khaki. Uh, these are linen worn with a, you know, the blue 1940s jacket. Again, it doesn't look crazy. It looks pretty normal. Mm -hmm. And then over here you can see it works a little with brown. A lot of earth tones in this outfit. Got that little bit of green there and accenting it with the brown shoes. So. If Spencer likes cream pants, I love gray trousers. Uh, they're kind of the formal alternative to cream pants. Um, they kind of, again, they go with everything. And I just want to emphasize that these, I'm going for more of like a light gray to medium gray. I think that a kind of a charcoal gray is a little bit too businessy. It's a little bit too dark. It's not as uh, versatile. Uh, but you can see here it works with you know window pane. It works with, uh, again, blue and even a light colored uh, jacket. And see, we wear it. I mean, we wear it all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, again, with navy here, I have wear it with white, and you can see it doesn't it doesn't clash too much. It looks very uh, very normal. And then Spencer here is wearing a uh, 
a brown check jacket with like kind of a, a little bit darker gray trousers, but again, it still works together. Okay. Now we're going to kind of go into like a very general guide to the you know basic stylings uh, by decade. So if you're going for specifically 20s look or 30s look, this is how to really simply kind of get that. Right. But if you you know if you just want the easy ch cheap way or like yeah. kind of a cheat sheet to kind of do it, it's literally the ties. Ties mm -hmm. help dictate the era. Um, not a lot of people know this, but uh, like in the 30s, you can see it's a lot more like stripes. You got a little bit of prints here. It's a lot more tighter. Um, you got some checks here, and that's an easy way to do like a 30s look. Like right now, I'm wearing a uh, a 60s suit by making it look 30s with kind of like a small repeated pattern that you've seen in the in the pictures that we've shown you. Um, if you want to go for like a 40s to 50s look, uh, the ties got a lot wilder, mm -hmm. a lot a lot shorter actually as well. Um, but you know, it's we call it the swing bold era. You know, when guys were swing dancing, they had their cool colored ties just flapping around. Uh, and then when you get to like the late 50s and early 60s, uh, ties got a lot slimmer, uh, the, tie, the designs got a lot more minimal, and they kind of got more of a vertical pattern, you know, to kind of draw the eye up, it kind of emphasize that kind of slim figure. And if you've seen La La Land, uh, Sebastian wears a lot of these type of ties. So the first thing we're going to start out with is the 1920s. Uh, it's really kind of hard to get an early 20s look, you can see that one in the middle just because the proportions were so different. Uh, you'll notice the jackets are very slim, the buttoning stance is very high. It's like above the waist almost. Yeah. yeah, and then the jackets are really long. So that's not, unless you unless you get it custom made or if you find like an actual suit from the early 20s, it's kind of hard to do that. Yeah, it's, it's extremely rare to find an actual 20s uh, suit. Or our, friend, our friend Blake has like three. Yeah, he's, a, he's a very slim guy, you get to find that. Um, but later on the decade, uh, later on in the decade, the suits got a lot more like kind of quote unquote modern looking. So if you if if you have a three piece suit, you can kind of like make it look twenties. Just get a club collar right. that is just a rounded one. Bonus points if it is detachable, uh, and then you can you can kind of wear that with a slimmer tie. And they like Ethan said wore a lot of stripes, but then also kind of uh, brocade patterns. So this is like a thirties brocade tie, mm -hmm. uh, but there was a lot of ties like that in the twenties too. And then uh, the third image, if you're if you really want to go for it. <laughs> Uh, if you get a pair of plus fours, that really screams 20s. Those were kind of the like sporting, you know, they're casual very, pants. Yeah, like, it's like they're casual suits yeah. kind of thing. And so my favorite era is the 1930s. Um, it's a lot more classic. We call it the golden era uh, for good reason because this looks almost, you know, something, something that you'd see on a daily basis. You know, again, they're wearing a check tie. This guy's wearing kind of a check tie as well. Um, he's wearing a striped tie. It's very simple. Um, the jackets, again, fit pretty perfectly, normal buttoning stances. It's not like the 20s where it was super high. The jackets have a normal length, and the pants, again, are hemmed pretty perfectly right there. I mean, they might be a little bit wider than what you're used to, um, but uh, it's, uh, it's a good look. And so we, I do this almost all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, here we have a modern suit. Uh, it's a lot softer than what you'd see back in the day, but I make it 30s with the collar bar. Uh, the same shirt I'm wearing today, actually. Full coincidence. And uh, a kind of a geometric pattern tie. This is a true 30s suit. Um, it's it's pretty much perfect. I think you know the we've got the subtle hourglass figure, um, perfectly hemmed pants. Again, shoulder fit is on point there. Sleeves fit perfectly, and I accent that again with the micro stripe blue shirt hint hint, uh, and a kind of a cool fun circular uh, striped tie. And then Spencer's got kind of a more casual look with gray odd trousers, um, the vest that I'm wearing today. Yeah and a brown jacket. And again, you can't really see it there, but he's wearing kind of a geometric pattern tie with a striped blue shirt. Uh, so then when we get into the 40s and 50s, early on in the 40s, uh, everything kind of looked, it was very similar to the stuff that you saw in the 30s, just maybe a little bit more exaggerated. After the war, when there was no fabric rationing, that's when we got into what Ethan said earlier, the bold era. I'm wearing a 40s suit right now, and you can see the shoulders are a lot more padded. Uh, there's a little bit more fabric in the jacket. It's not quite as fitted as we saw in like the, the late 30s. Mm -hmm. uh, the pants are a lot wider and the buttoning stance started to get lower. So early, like early in the 50s, that's when it was super low. This is like mid to late 40s. Yeah, when you see a 50 suit, you'll know. Like it's, it's heavy yeah. shoulder padding and just kind of a really drop buttoning stance. Mm -hmm. Very similar to what the 80s did, but the 80s went all in on the 50s. Yeah. So they were really crazy. It was kind of like a caricature of stuff right. in the 50s. And so then you'll see, oh, oh sneak preview. 
Uh, not there yet. There we go. There we go. Um, so the, the the easiest way to do a '40s look is to just get a swing tie because that's you know, like the first one. Ethan is wearing a uh, an actual '40s suit. You can be extended shoulders. There. Yeah, but because of the tie, it really it's it's just you know very obviously '40s. Uh, other two, he's not wearing suits from the '40s. But again, because of that that tie, it just you know it's something that really screams. This is from the nineteen forties. Yeah, it's a lot different again from the thirties where things were a lot more geometric. Mm-hmm. I mean, people they had fun designing these ties. Yeah. Okay. So next we have here the nineteen sixties. We call this like the Mad Men era or the Ivy League era. Um, these suits were a lot different than what you see earlier. They kind of kind of rebelled, I guess, against mm-hmm. the kind of the bold look. The jackets got a lot more minimal design. They got a little bit longer, and um, they don't really have a lot of waist suppression. Um, the lapels got a lot smaller, uh, they weren't as wide as they were before, and they opted for three button jackets as, as opposed to two, and you'll see that they're wearing uh, button down collars, we call them OCBDs for Oxford Cloth Button Downs, it's uh, something that's very ivy, very 60s, and you see that the shirts are pretty much all plain, they're not wearing blue striped shirts, uh, you know, they're, and they kind of add the character by adding s- striped ties, you know, very, again, very corporate-ish looking, uh, and even plain ties. And so one of the best ways to do that is just going with a striped tie and a, and a suit or a jacket that's got very uh, slim lapels but not too small. And the first one, I'm doing stripes on stripes uh, with a three-button gray jacket. Here, I'm wearing this exact same suit with an Oxford cloth button-down collar and a striped tie. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen Mad Men, but Lane Price wears a lot of like co- odd vests, contrasting. Yeah. That uh, one's called Tattersall. Yeah, that kind of cool check pattern. And then Spencer's kind of got a but more kind of like a young collegiate look with a subtle uh, plaid jacket um, with a button-down collar and a striped tie. And something that, you, again, you'll notice that's a lot different is that the shoulders are not um, padded like they were before. They were very natural shoulders, very soft. Um, and the jacket doesn't have as much of a body as they did before, but it, it, it still looks cool. It's still a great way to do like a 60s kind of look. So we're going to leave with some uh, closing thoughts. So first thing, if you if you have you know if you don't want to wear a full suit, maybe you have a couple of cool sport coats, and you're like, I don't know what to wear with this. If you invest in some cream pants or white pants and gray pants, like you're, you're covered. Yeah, you're set. Like for life, everything goes with those. Uh, next, you know, a white pocket square, which you can see on Spencer and me, and probably almost all the images that we, <laughs> yeah. that we did. Um, it really elevate the outfit. I know mm-hmm. you know there are still. Floral uh, pocket square. I wear a lot of floral pocket squares. Yeah, yeah. I know, but if you know, if you again, if you're in doubt, just throw on a white one. It goes with pretty much everything. And it's just like you know, you put a little bit more thought in the outfit. It's yeah. like a step above. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, so we didn't talk about this much. We cuff all our pants. That was pretty standard up until like the mid '60s. We lost cuffs with bell bottoms. Yeah, it's not something that you don't really see as much anymore. But we think that the cuffs really just kind of you know they help the pants drape a little bit better and they just look a little bit cleaner. We really like them. Right, yeah, it's a really simple alteration to do, um, and you know, I do them even on my chinos, they kind mm-hmm. of add that elevated look. Um, next, uh, again, trouser fit and shoulder fit is really important. Shoulders you cannot fix, and trousers, you know, again, you don't have to go with a, a very minimal break if you don't want to, but we think, it, again, it looks very clean, and you mm-hmm. can see in the images that we showed you, it was pretty standard through the 30s, 40s, up until the 60s. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you don't wear suspenders on a belt. They both do the same thing, and it's kind of redundant. Uh, right. So just choose one or the other. Right. Um, and last, I mean, just to be comfortable. I mean, Spencer and I would not dress up as much as we do if we weren't comfortable in what we were wearing. Mm-hmm. Again, this applies to wearing, you know, don't wear tweeds in summertime, yeah. and don't wear linen in, in the wintertime, you know. Just dress to be comfortable, and it even applies to, like, how you style yourself. Exactly. You know, we want you guys to be confident in what you're wearing, and mm-hmm. if you're proud of the outfit, then... It yeah, doesn't matter. When then you'll we, be fine. Like our kind of philosophy when it comes to dressing up is once you find your own personal style, if that's what you like, roll with it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, Spencer and I kind of do like a. Sometimes we do modern interpretation of vintage, or you know, or mixing and matching, and mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's it's up to us. We really enjoy it. Yeah, so. and I think we actually had just one more. slide. Oh, we did have one more slide. But okay, we'll just say it. So yeah, uh, if you want to follow us on Instagram. Right. Uh, my, my Instagram is Ethan M. Wong. I'm Spencer DSO. And you guys can ask us questions whenever you want. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's we, we answer everything all the time. It's really, we're, we're going to be at the park tomorrow, so if you want to say hi, you can uh, say hi if you want. Ethan has a blog. Yeah, it's uh, Street X Spretza. It's uh, basically, it's right there. I talk about uh, vintage clothing, modern clothing, how to, you know, it's kind of tailor it, kind of the cool stuff I find. 
And it's basically I help. everything. And he helps. Yeah. Know, on the sidelines. No, I'm just uh, and then we just launched a podcast that is Style and Direction. You can find it wherever you get For, your podcasts. Yeah, exactly. And it's basically this, like, except you can't see us. Right. So. Uh, it's been, yeah, basically yeah. we talk. It's about every two weeks we're gonna release something, mm-hmm. and it's not only us discussing menswear, but also getting cool guests that we think are cool, like Benny that we talked about earlier, the hat makers, some, yeah. like you know, getting some of the stories that you don't normally see out there, like in GQ or something. And so now I think we have time to take a couple questions. Of questions. Right. Um, so for any additional questions, actually, uh, we have about ten minutes. But then if we want to keep going on, we can. Outside. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, but please too. give a warm round of applause <laughs> to Ethan Long and Spencer Thank you. That was really Thank you. Yeah, oh, and don't worry, like, on my blog, literally, I, the most recent article is kind of a compilation of mm-hmm. the different stuff that I've written about all... It's I write, just a more in-depth version of this. Exactly, yeah, we go into a lot of pictures, so... So we'll take a few questions here. Yes. Oh, yeah. Right. Can you just talk a little bit about shoes as far as, like, how those, like, what styles do you... Can you talk a little bit about shoes and uh, like what styles do you think fit the eras that you were discussing specifically in terms of like two tones, brogues, etc. Et right. Okay. So uh, shoes, I think, don't cha- have it changed as much as yeah. like, jacket fits. I could, like this is just you know minimalistic shoes tend to work for everything. I have a pair of like Johnson and Murphy shoes from like probably the eighties that are just very simple with a cap toe and those. Right. Yeah. yeah. Those fit so with basically, everything. you know, wing tips, cap toes, they kind of work with everything. Um, when it comes to stuff like this, I all, I usually just wear my spectators with kind of more you know fun bold outfits like this. Right. Yeah. Because I mean, once you get to the part where you kind of want to want to mix eras, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. And because I mean, spectators were worn in yeah, the nineteen tens, you know, onwards. So if you want to wear them until the sixties, yeah. yeah. So, but I think you know if you do like that that rockabilly look in the fifties, that's uh-huh. kind of more two tone thing. Um, I think movie stars kind of warm, but again, mm-hmm. it's up to personal preference whether you want to stand out with your shoes yeah. uh, or not. Um, again, shoe design really hasn't changed. Uh, we want you to find good year welted shoes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I get my shoes on eBay. Same thing with vintage uh, or even thrifting if you if you're lucky and you find the size. Like these were like ten dollars, and they turned out to be like a hundred dollar pair of like floor shimes, and they're very great quality. They've stood the test of rain in London. So if that doesn't tell you how good these are, then I don't know what to tell you. Um, but basically, I hope this answers your question yes, regarding shoes. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Uh, we yes. have time for more questions. Oh, cool. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, we have any book recommendations? Oh, oh yeah. shoot. I have a bunch of coffee table books. Um, th- it's it's called like the Dandy's Guide to Dating Vintage Menswear. That's, yeah, that's a great reference. You can, then you can the, find it on Amazon, I think. Yeah, right? and then this is uh, a vintage store in London, the, the Vintage Warehouse, something like that. Yeah. They put out a couple coffee table books. That's less informative and more like check out these cool clothes. Right. Um, we, we mainly get our information on the internet. Uh, there's a couple of tumblers that we follow. Mm-hmm. And again, getting into this whole, there's actually a whole community of people who dress vintage. I don't know if you guys have seen them out in the expo. But, you know, we get together a lot. And asking these people questions, you know, kind of like this, it's the best way to learn. So, wait, really quick. This is, if you're looking for book recommendations, yeah, this right. is like the holy grail. It's really hard to find. And it's like the Esquire... Mm-hmm. Guide to Menswear of the 20th Century. Check like your that. local libraries. Cause, yeah, uh, that book has been out of print since like the 70s. And, and if you find it on eBay, it's like $500. But a lot of local libraries have them. Yeah, they kind of, they literally go into the history of every era, which jackets were popular when. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really, really in depth. It's yeah, we a, actually it's found a tome. It's yeah. a huge. It's, yeah. yeah, it's huge. We actually got, got our hands on it at my old university's library. So we were able uh, to actually look at it. It's really, mm-hmm. really in depth. Um, but then, of course, if you want just kind of general style stuff, Alec Alan Fluster does stuff. Um, he has a book, I think, like Dressing the Man. Um, you know, he has some illustrations that we just that we showed you guys. Uh, he talks about how to apply them. Some of it's kind of dated because you know, it came out like in the '80s or '90s, but it's still a, a good source of information. Uh, Bruce Boyer, he's a um, he's a menswear kind of historian writer. Again, another great book, uh, good author on menswear. Um, and there's some, uh, I think. Maybe a costuming shop or some art stores might yeah. have. Oh yeah, because okay, yeah. So a lot of a lot of theater uh, places they have books on like different guides to different eras. I'm gonna be honest, for the most part, they're not great because a lot of them are just like illustrations, and they're like, this is a '70s interpretation of 
you know, clothes from the 30s. But there are a few that have actual photos, and those are usually Yeah, cool. yeah. Again, look, if you're looking for inspiration, try and look for, like, you know, Life Magazine pictures, mm -hmm. uh, people, like, from the actual, like, Jimmy Stewart, Fred Astaire. You know, we don't really trust movies a lot, because we kind of think of, like, The Gatsby Movie, while, you know, it's a great, it's a fun recent film. Movies we're talking, yeah. yeah, recent movies. It's, like, 2012's vision of what the yeah. 20s looked like. So, again, it's not as accurate. Um, even, like... The old Gatsby movie with, uh, with Robert, Robert Redford, Redford yeah. is literally like a 70s interpretation of the 20s were. So mm -hmm. if you want to see actual stuff, look at the real people. Yeah. Yeah. Does that help answer your, your question? Cool. Thank you. Anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, can you talk a little bit about socks and the shoes? Gotcha. Okay. So socks, um, there are some illustrations. Oh, we wish we should have put some on oh, there. Oh, man, but, yeah. But mainly, I think Argyle and Striped, I think, were the main stuff. I mean, guys. Yeah, because no, it's like, because they did... I, uh, I don't know what it's called, but it's like this pattern where it's a solid sock and then they just kind of have a stripe down the side. Yeah, it's That was of, really common. Yeah, it's a very kind of a minimalistic kind of a thing. I, I mostly wear either solid socks like that. I have a couple argyle socks and then I really like horizontal striped socks. There you go. Yeah, those are pretty much classic. Um, and if, you're, if you want something easy, if you don't want to think about it, I like navy, navy blue socks go with mm -hmm. everything, maybe even a dark gray. Yeah. Um, because I think we, we like to, this is our personal style, but we prefer to kind of have like our, our tie and our mm -hmm. shirt or even our suit be like the main star of the outfit. And if you're doing kind of like a really bold outfit, it might not be as good to have, you know, really patterned mm -hmm. sock that goes with it. But again, that's up to personal preference yeah. if you want to. Oh, those. Oh, well, those artists. I think were just kind of worn throughout the whole. Yeah, throughout. Yeah, you know, it was kind of like, kind of a cool thing to have, like yeah. tie bars and everything. Um, I think as pants got slimmer, they, I don't think they wore them as much. So maybe like the mid '60s, and you know, when you get to like bell bottoms, I don't mm -hmm. think guys wore them with their disco suits. Yeah. Um, but I mean, they're still a really cool accessory. It's kind of subtle. Mm -hmm. It's kind of just you know. Yeah, I, I feel one. cool for wearing. I have Spencer's one. Got. I have one, and I would wear it more often, except it's like actually vintage, and the elastic is like falling apart. Right, and so. I'm sure that there are plenty of like uh, reproduction people that make them. Yeah, probably a lot better. Um, so they help them, you know, help them stay up. It's a mm -hmm. cool detail. Yeah. So cool. Yes. Yeah, uh, there's a whole bunch of places to find repro women stuff. Right. Okay, Simon James Cathcart. Yeah, SJC. If you look that up on Instagram. Yeah, or he's a anything. he's a relatively new seller. Uh, when he said, "Oh, I, Spencer's wearing that vest that I'm wearing now," it's not the same vest. We, we, didn't, both, we don't share clothes. We <laughs> both we both got one because it's so cool. Yeah. Um. He's yeah. He's in England. It's it's a really small operation. It's basically him. It kind of operates kind of like a Kickstarter where you know yeah. he, he makes them after a certain number of orders come in. They're really good. They just came out with a 1930s yeah. reproduction suit and a 1930s with, reproduction work. Suit, yeah, which I got because yes. it was two hundred dollars cheaper. Yeah, uh, but you know there there are people who do it. Um, uh, I think there's there's a few we don't really know too much just because we buy a lot of true vintage because you know sometimes uh, reproduction can get a little bit more expensive. It's mm -hmm. almost like you know buying a custom suit uh, more often than not. But yeah, um, SKC is making the best stuff out there right now. Yeah, and so. it's it's actually designed by a lot of our friends who have the actual garments and then they they like take measurements, take patterns. exactly. So yeah, he's one of the best ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other? We have time for one more. Make it good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right in the back. If you're starting, yes. What, you mentioned the whole basic clothing. Oh, right. For uh, basic suits and jackets, stuff like that. Um, we really recommend the like a blue suit. I yeah. think just kind of gets it right out of the bat because it's the easiest one to wear separately. Like mm -hmm. navy blue trousers by themselves look really good. The jacket goes with literally everything. Um, I would say you know a gray suit. A secondary. Um, I some guys say do the gray suit first because it's a little bit more. Uh, yeah, we both like navy a little bit. Yeah, more. just because I think it, it works better with colors. It's a little bit more deeper. Um, and then of course, once you get the gray and the blue suit, you can just kind of mix match the trousers mm -hmm. and the jackets together. Uh, third, I would say a brown suit. Yep, that goes with all everything. Yeah, I love we both wear brown suits like every day. Yeah, so. at his work they call him like they. They, they they just like so I work in men's warehouse. Um, I I'm the only guy that wears brown. Like on a regular basis, and so every time we get in something that's brown, they're like, "Hey, Spencer, look at this. look at this. You think this is cool? Yeah, yeah." But again, like uh, brown trousers also go with everything. Brown jackets go with everything, um, and it, uh, I don't think we talked about this too, but um, brown jackets are very uncommon to find out in like the wild. Mm -hmm. So when you wear it, it looks like it's vintage. Oh like, yeah. Whoa, because you know, again, guys mainly wear navy blue. And, and gray. And so like when you wear it, you know, it's, it stands out. And you mm -hmm. can also wear the jacket with jeans, too, if you want. Yeah. Kind of got that tweed professorly look, kind of stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And for a fourth, I don't really... We wear a lot of I mean, gray, blue, and brown. So yeah, it's like, I mean, cream. Like, yeah, if you're, you're, you're going to go... Yeah, then you, you can wear the wild. pants. 
by themselves. Yeah. Uh, but if you want to do after that, I think experimenting with jackets, you know, different patterns, yeah. doing the same colors in different patterns. Like, oh, you want to do a pinstripe navy blue suit. Mm -hmm. You could do a window pane brown suit, stuff like that. I think will kind of round out your your collection. Yep. Cool. So. So, all right, yeah, that's, it. that's all we have time for, but I mean, we're not doing much. So. Yeah, so if you guys want to talk to us afterward, ask yeah. questions more for free. Mm -hmm. Thank you so, so much, Ethan yeah, and Spencer.